Welcome to Wireless Land Weekly, a podcast focused on the wireless networking professional. We aim to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire. Get ready to listen and enjoy. Now to our host of the show, Keith Parsons. Welcome back. This is Keith Parsons, your host again of Wireless Land Weekly, brought to you by wirelesslandprofessionals.com. We're glad you're here today. And today we have for our technical segments, the first is Ryan Woodings of MetaGeek. We'll be bringing us visualizing the RF layer. Our discussion with Ryan is great, and we learn a lot about how to, how to see the things that are going on in the RF environment. And then that will be followed by Dave Hutchison, a guy who's been out in the field for over 25 years, and he's going to talk to us about the reliability of electronics and what we can do to help the reliability of our electronics. So sit back and listen. We're ready to start the show. Today's wireless networking definition from the CWNP Dictionary of Wireless Terms and Acronyms. This is Joel Barrett, and today's term is VSWR. It's Voltage Standing Wave Ratio. It's a reflected signal caused by an impedance mismatch between devices, such as connectors, cables, access points, things that you'd find in an RF system. VSWR is the ratio of the maximum voltage to the minimum voltage in a standing wave pattern. And a standing wave is developed when power is reflected from a load. So the VSWR is a measure of how much power is delivered to a device as opposed to the amount of power that is reflected from the device. If the source and load impedance are the same, the VSWR is one-to-one and there is no reflected power. So the VSWR is also a measure of how closely the source and load impedance are matched. For most antennas in WLAN, it is a measure of how close the antenna is to a perfect 50-ohm signature. So this is Joel Barrett for the CWNP Dictionary, and tune in again for the CWNP Dictionary Term of the Day. Rant, pet peeve, what really bugs you? 60 seconds of complaining starts now. Okay, my personal rant is on manufacturers of wireless equipment who don't tell consumers what uh, frequency spectrum the device is operating in. And uh, an example of this is like if you walk into a a retail organization and you purchase a wireless uh, video or wireless audio system, you you might take it home and set up the, uh, your, your audio system and, uh, position your wireless speakers, and then all of a sudden, after everything is up and running, uh, you find out that your wireless network is not working anymore, or it's not working as good as it used to. And so that's my personal peeve, is that uh, I'd like to see manufacturers of these products blatantly display what spectrum these devices are operating in so that you can understand how it's going to potentially impact your existing wireless network. Things every wireless LAN professional needs to know. Gear up, buckle down, and stand by for the real techie stuff. Hello again, this is Keith Parsons, and today I'm talking with Ryan Woodings. He's the chief geek of a company called MetaGeek. They're the makers of the Wi-Spy product line. And today's topic is visualizing the RF physical layer. Ryan, go ahead. All right, thanks, Keith. So... We got into this this business because um, a lot of wireless tools like NetStumbler and things like that, they, they show you the other wireless networks that are out there, but there's a lot of other things going on in the RF space that you can't see with those tools. You're kind of blind to what's really going on. And so um, I was working in a company doing wireless mice and keyboards and kind of got into this, realizing that if I could see the signals from the cordless phones, wireless mice, security cameras, I have a much better chance of um, setting up my wireless network correctly so that I won't be getting issues, um, drop networks, or um, really reduce throughput because of all these other things that are going on. So if I can see what's going on, I can say, oh, well, channel one's bad in this area. I need to move to channel six or... Maybe I need to go and get a different cordless phone or things like that. So our tools really help you to see what's going on so you can pick the right channel and you can easily troubleshoot these kind of RF physical layer issues. Well, one of the things I uh, use when I'm teaching wireless is uh, I give the analogy, I really wish I could give all of all of the students in class, uh, Jordy LaForge's visor from the Star Trek. Mm-hmm. He could see yeah. all RF. And there's there's something about being able to see with our eyes. I mean, we've been looking at the visible light in the electromagnetic spectrum for you know ever since we're born. 
this RF spectrum we can't quite see. So how does uh, the Y-Spy products take that RF information and let you physically see it in colors and shapes? Mm -hmm. that, that's a really good question. Um, another example that I really like as far as taking data and combining it, which I think will help, kind of help describe what we do, is in Hunt for Red October, when he's, um, the submarine disappears, but Sonar Guy says, oh, well, when it disappeared, I thought I could hear whales singing in the background. And he took that data, this raw data of the whales singing, and he fiddled around with it and looked at it a couple different ways and decided that if he sped it up, it um, ended up, you could tell that it was a mechanical signal. You hear the thump, thump, thump of the rotors in the back of the Red October as it disappeared. So being able to look at the data a different way and how do you combine it, that's what we do. So we basically take, you know, we're continuously scanning the 2.4 gigahertz RF band and then we take all that raw data and we're like, okay, what do we do with that? So at first we just showed you, okay, well, let's look at the average um, amplitude at each frequency and look at, let's look at the max. And then it's like, well, as things shift over time, you're not seeing those changes in time. And so then we came up with a waterfall view that shows you over time the changes. And it was like, well, how do you color that? And so we decided to base it off of the typical weather map where it's like red is hot, blue is cold. So for us, um, blue is really low signals and red are really high signals. And so with that waterfall view, you can see um, if you have devices changing frequency or if you have a Wi-Fi network that was you know, pretty inactive and all of a sudden it's active, you can see those changes over time really easily. Um, then we came up with a couple other different views to help you kind of see the signatures of the devices. Like most Wi-Fi signals are about 22 megahertz wide. They're kind of a nice bell arch. And then when 802.11g came out, it has more of a flat top, looks more like, like a mesa in Arizona. Um, and so you can start to see these patterns and be able to tell what types of devices are transmitting in your area. Then we had the 2D view that kind of shows you the outline. We had the um, waterfall view, but we didn't have any way to combine the time, frequency, amplitude all into a single, a single display. And so we came up with the three-dimensional view, which basically has frequency, amplitude, and time as the three dimensions. And with this, it's really easy to see amplitude changes as well as frequency changes in your environment, uh, which helps you to, if you're going to track down a device, kind of locate the interferer where it's coming from, or you just want to get a get good overview of what's going on in your area. The 3D view is really easy to kind of just quickly glance at and say, okay, I kind of get it. You know, this is a quiet channel, this is a loud channel, this is the types of device and devices that are transmitting. So basically what we do is we just try to take all this raw data and come up with easy ways to um, display it to the user so that it makes sense. It's um, pretty intuitive to kind of see what you're looking at. It can help them. So right out of the box, they can look at it and say, okay, I get what's going on without having to go to, you know, training classes and read a bunch of manuals and things like that. It's just plug it in, install it, and, and go, and you can get a lot of good data out of it right away. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I, I personally like the 3D view. Uh, let you see also consistency if something is constant. Mm -hmm. There's a, I had a client who was had a, a consistent every 60 seconds this problem would happen, and in the, in the first views, you couldn't see that consistency, uh, mm -hmm. but when you let it w come over the 3D with the time, you can see it. It was popping up every 60 seconds, the same thing. And that and that signature, not just its 2D signature, but its signature over time also helped us evaluate and find out what it was. Wow. So what was it? It was a, uh, <laughs> it was a purposeful jammer that was configured to actually send out a 802.11 pulse every 60 seconds. And it was loud enough that it knocked everyone off the channel they would roam, and then 60 seconds later, it would knock them off again. Uh, it was a pretty evil little device. But I would have missed it if I hadn't had the, the time view to see it at the same time. Well, what kind of, uh, one of the things I've noticed when I'm working with uh, spectrum analyzers is uh, resolution. Some things are really small. Like you'd mentioned mice. They don't take very much bandwidth. Um, other things, like the 802.11 are wide, 20 megahertz wide, or with 802.11n now 40 megahertz wide, um, how, can you use your product to zoom in and if you especially want to look at a specific channel? Yeah, definitely. Um, when we started, the 2.4 gigahertz was the only really popular um, band, and now they came out with all the 5 gigahertz stuff with the 11N. It's getting really popular. And that band is like 5.15 to 5.85, and that's 700 megahertz wide band, so there's a lot going on there. 
Um, and so we made our tools so you can configure it to look at the entire band, or you can select a single channel to zoom into. You can also, um, we all, you can just set any starter stop frequency. So you can look at just a single megahertz if you wanted to, or five megahertz if you're looking at Zigbee signals, um, or look at, you know, a couple different Wi-Fi channels that are next to each other at, at one time. Um, this is good for a couple things. If you really want really high precision for that frequency, or you want to go really fast and just get, um, sweep it as fast as you can time-wise so that that's pretty useful for tracking down the device. You can watch its um, amplitude changes over time. So it's, you can either go fast and see a wide area but with not a lot of resolution or zoom in and spend a little more time dwelling on those? Is that yeah, that's that's correct. And with the kind of zoom in, it also helps you to see those um, outlines with the signature of the device um, from you know, if you're kind of zoomed out, it's sometimes hard to differentiate between like a Zigbee and um, some of the other kind of weird cordless phones that are out there, something like that. And so as you zoom in, you get a really precise outline of the device. Well, for uh, a, lot, a lot of people will be using these uh, tools to help them with their Wi-Fi. In looking at the Wi-Fi, I had a kind of a, a question just came off the top of my head that uh, someone had asked me a while ago. In 802.11b, you have the nice CCK curve. It looks like the hump, as you described it. It has little notches in it. There's like a center notch and two little side notches. What are those all about? Mm-hmm. You put me on the spot with a question I don't really know the answer to. I was just yeah. Let's, I, let's I was interested in what, what what actually what those I, I'm are. I'm not sure, but um, at first when we were developing our um, topographic view, um, which we now call the density view. We saw those little glitches and we're like, what is going on? This isn't working right. And then it's like, oh, wait, as you zoom in, no, those are really there. And a lot of times they show up really strong. Um, you'll also notice on 811G, there's the little dip right in the middle. So it's flat across the top, but there's a little V right in the middle. Um, and I think it really has to do with the modulation scheme and how they're doing it. But I, I don't know exactly what causes them. But they're obviously there. Yeah, they're obviously there. Yeah, which which means your analyzer is actually catching it and seeing that they're there. Uh, why they're produced, I still don't know, but uh, at least we can see them. So in your process of coming up with different ways to visualize the RF data, what uh, format did that data come in to start with? I mean, it was just a whole string of numbers and you're doing math on that? Yeah, we just get a whole string of numbers. So basically what we're doing is we're stepping across the frequency band in um, steps anywhere from like one megahertz wide down to, I think we go down to about uh, 60 kilohertz wide little steps. And so we take a measurement at each step and then we just shove all the data up from the hardware into the software and the software processes it. And we did it this way to keep the hardware as low cost as possible so we can just do all the processing and visualization in the software. And once the software gets it, we um, we save it to a file so it can go back and pause it, play it, you know, whatever we need to do. And we take that data and we aggregate it in a couple different ways. So we're looking at the average over the time frame that we have in, in, in view. We're looking at the max, the current, and then we also take it and do a two-dimensional array of frequency and amplitude. And then we basically increment the array so that we can get this like two-dimensional picture, how often these points hit. And then we also are taking it over time. And so we're getting time slices that sometimes is two or three sweeps, sometimes up to 10, 20 sweeps together into one little slice of time. And that's how we do the waterfall view. And so we're, we're taking all this raw data in and we're building up a couple different models of it in the software so that we can visualize it different ways. Great. You, I, I've, I have noticed that your uh, hardware is a, a lot less expensive than some of your competitors. And you mentioned you do that by having more of the the heavy lifting taking place in the software side? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, um, as you probably know, recently one of our competitors just came out with what they label as the industry's first USB-based professional spectrum analyzer. And I kind of laugh because it's like, well, that's true if professional you mean expensive. Because uh, we've had a USB-based spectrum analyzer with wireless network information for about a year and a half now. So um, we'd definitely like to keep our costs down, make it easier for our customers to be able to buy the product. And um, a lot of our customers are consultants or um, wireless troubleshooting isn't their full-time gig. I mean, maybe they're sort of the IT guy in the small office. They have a few access points, but the office isn't big enough to have one full-time dedicated person that's just an expert at this. So we get a lot of guys that are sort of what I would say semi-pros. 
um, a lot of our competition is more the enterprise and they're like the big leagues, but we have a lot of people that are more of the farm leagues, the local, the local team type guys where, you know, they kind of know what they're doing, but they don't have a lot of money to spend on expensive tools and they don't have time to go to training classes and learn how to, the ins and outs of all their expensive tools. They just need something that's, that's pretty low cost, that's easy to use and will just help them solve their problems so they can get back to their normal job. That's good. And, and, and there, there's a lot more people in the farm leagues. Exactly. A lot more people. We get a lot more people like K-12 schools, things like that, where, you know, sometimes it's the third grade teacher. Sometimes it's the third grader, right? That they're like, they're in charge of the network. And, you know, that's they probably do a pretty good job, too. Yeah, they do. So after we see all this visualized raw RF information, um, how how can the the Wi-Fi, the wireless LAN professional take that and make decisions on how to fix their wireless network? Uh, your, your tool does definitely shows visually what's there. Uh, it's the next mm-hmm. step. So what's the next step after seeing something? Mm-hmm. Um, well, our tool is used in two different um, settings. One is kind of pre-installation, just to get a feel for what's going on there. Is you know, is it even um, can I even put wireless here? Should I use 2.4? Do I need really need to go and buy the more expensive stuff and go to 5 gigahertz here? Um, that sort of thing. And so for the pre-installation, it really helps just kind of get a feel for what's going on to make sure that you get the right equi- equipment installed, put on the right channel, so that you're not going to get issues, you know, the next week, the week after that. Um, the other situation is troubleshooting an existing network where your throughput just all of a sudden starts dropping, or um, you know, you're just not getting the connectivity that you think you should have in certain locations in your office. And so for that, it's really helpful to track down the interference where it's coming from. Um, also just to be kind of that first layer where it's like, okay, is this an RF physical layer problem or not? And so once you can kind of narrow that out, then you can either move up the, up the, um, the OSI layers, or you can just kind of start probing into the interference layer. Um, if it is RF interference issue, our, um, our tools can help you track it down. Once you track it down, there's a couple things. I mean, if you control the device, then you can usually set it to a different channel. If it's coming from a neighboring office, sometimes you can talk to them to change you know, what channels they're using. Um, our last office, when we first got there, there were networks on about eight of the LAN channels in 2.4 gigahertz. And it took us a couple months. We convinced everybody to change to 1611. Let's get it all separated. And we also looked at kind of balancing which networks were active to make sure the active networks weren't all on channel 6, for instance, but that they were separated between 1, 6, and 11 as well. And um, so our tool is kind of useful to help you see which channels you should go to. Sometimes you're getting interference from devices that you don't have control of. Uh, for instance, we had a customer that they were upstairs from a bar, and down on the bar they had this um, wireless TV transmitter. The DVD player was under the counter, and the TV was up in the corner, and so they did a wireless video transmission. And so every afternoon when the bar opened up, I think it was like 3 o'clock, the um, upstairs wireless network was interfered with, and so there's nothing they could really do with that. And I think they had to basically just switch channels for their own access point to get away from the, the wireless video transmitter. Good. Do you have any other, uh, uh, we, we like hearing uh, customer stories. Any other good customer stories of how uh, people are using Wi-Spy? Yeah, actually, we had um, a pretty funny story a couple months ago, which um, resulted in a good payoff for us. Um, I have a story from the customer. I could just read it to you if you'd like. Oh, that'd be fine. Um, okay. Um, it starts out, I work for a wireless LAN manufacturer who sells enterprise WLAN systems. Recently, our tech support group asked if I could help them out with a customer. Apparently, the customer was seeing constant drops in the wireless network. He couldn't understand what was going on. One of our engineers told him that it looked like a lot, looked a lot like some kind of RF interference. But without an analyzer, no one could prove it. The customer thought we were just trying to shift blame when we told him there was interference. After all, he couldn't actually see the interference, and he knew that lots of companies had microwaves, so why was it only bothering him? Hence the call to me. So off I went with my 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi to see the customer. The first thing we did after I got there was hook it up and check out the RF topology. Although the noise ceiling was a bit higher than I'd have liked, it didn't seem too bad. Then the early morning shift in the warehouse next door got a break. About 15 people walked into the break room next to the offices, and the first thing they all did was to line up the microwaves and heat up something to eat. I happened to be watching Channelizer when this happened, and we saw his H11 BG network got almost completely lost in the interference. You could barely see it in the background. The RF from the break room was that bad. About 30 minutes later, the break was over, and they all went back to work. 
Suddenly, the WLAN was good again, but alas, it was short-lived because another group came off shift about an hour and a half later and did the exact same thing. Strangely enough, we got the exact same results. This was with me sitting as far away from the break room as I could and still be in the building. No real difference in the interference. It whomped the network, but, but good for everyone, everywhere in the building. It was about this time the customer told me, oh yeah, did I mention there are people coming off shift about every hour or so? And so they did. And so I went with the network all day long. Our final count was five microwaves in the break room, two more in the office space, plus a commercial kitchen with a microwave on the second floor. Truly, this was a horrendous environment for an 811BG network. After letting the customer drive on the walk around with the wife spy on his own laptop, he realized just how bad it truly was. He told me he had no idea it was this bad and would have continued to think it it if he hadn't seen it with the wife spy analyzer. It gave everyone a sense that this problem was understood and with understanding the confidence on their part that it could be addressed and solved. The admin there that I was working with was so impressed with the analyzer that he immediately got his boss to approve the purchase of several. But since the Y-Spies wouldn't arrive for a few days, I went home one Y-Spy lighter since he borrowed it to tide him over until his very own Y-Spy DBX arrived. Um, and what the customer also didn't say in there was that because this was just swamping the 2.4 gigahertz network, they were able to basically explain to the customer, you really need to move to 5 gigahertz. And so you know, they helped the customer just realize that you know, spending the money to move to the five gigahertz network was basically the only thing to do. And so they ended up going with five gigahertz um, throughout the office and everything, and it works fine now. Yeah, I, I like I liked his quote there that it whomped the network. Nice term there. Yeah, yeah, it just whomped the network. And they were actually so, so happy and so impressed with it. This place is um, a seafood packing company that they overnighted us um, some fresh salmon and some fresh shrimp. And so we had a barbecue in our office. Nice, nice resolution there. Yeah, get a, yeah, get a barbecue yeah, out of it at the same happy. time. <laughs> and you got the sale out of it too, so it worked well. Uh, yeah, yeah, finding those uh, microwave ovens is pretty good. I, I noticed in part of your marketing campaign, you ship uh, popcorn. Yeah, yeah, we had some popcorn made up for a while that said, um, I think it had a couple instructions on, you know, put this in your microwave and fire for your wife's spy, and it said, now this is tasty interference. Hopefully, hopefully your microwave ovens aren't all doing that kind of leaky bit. Uh, yeah, we really don't like not, our, you know radiation coming in our homes, um, mm-hmm. but it's it's good tool to let you see whether or not they are leaking. Uh, yeah, because uh, not yeah, all microwaves they, leak, by the way. You know, and if they do leak, there's a, that's an issue there you can can address. Good story, by the way. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, that was a good coverage of uh, visualizing RF at the physical layer, and I agree with you. I think we've got to see it, and if we can't see it visually, then we're going to ignore it, and we'll look where there's not a problem. And so uh, I appreciate this little discussion here. Is there anything else you'd like to talk to us about visualizing RF? Um, I think that covers most of it. Um, One quote I really like from G.I. Joe is um, the knowing is half the battle. In this case, once you can see the wireless signals and see what's going to RF layer, I mean, that really helps you to figure out, okay, my RF layer's fine, let's go up, look at the different problem, or yeah, this is a problem here. And so it really is about being able to see it. Once you see it, you can understand, and then you can go and solve your problems. That's great. And Ryan, how can anyone track you down if they uh, need any more information? Our website is metageek.net. That's M-E-T-A-G-E-E-K.net. My email is ryan at metageek.net. And we're also on Twitter with the handle at metageek. Great. Well, I appreciate your time, and uh, we look forward to hearing you uh, more in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Interesting facts, little-known tidbits, things you might not have known, short little bits to set your mind a reeling. This is John Freeman with Xeris. One thing most people don't know is that Wi-Fi was created prior to any standard. The first company to ship a Wi-Fi access point was Intel that was designed by Zircom, the guys who made the real port card, which removed the dongle requirement for PCMSA cards. Elevator speech. Our guests have just two minutes to tell us all about their product or service offering. Ready, set, go. Hello, my name is Todd Lamley. I want to take a minute and tell you about myself. I've been in the networking industry for over 29 years. I've spent a lot of that time doing wireless licensed frequency bands and, of course, the unlicensed frequency bands. I published over 51 books, and my most popular book for a decade now is the Cybex CCNA Study Guide. However, I have a new book, the Cybex Cisco CCNA 
a wireless study guide, and uh, that one's coming out here in 2010, and it's covering the latest objectives for Cisco Unified Wireless Networks. If you are thinking about getting into Cisco Wireless or you have Cisco Wireless in your corporation, then I highly suggest the training from the Cisco CCNA. Global Net Training is my training company for more than 13 years, and I teach the CCNA Wireless class there. It is a great class where half the study guide is fundamentals of just basic wireless, because there is a lot of fundamentals of wireless that you really need to know, and half of it is the Cisco Unified Wireless Networks. When you come to the class, 90% of it is spent hands-on with the Cisco Unified Wireless Networks. You must have experience with Cisco controllers, the lightweight networks. It's very important to understand LWAP and CAPWAP and so on. And my company is specializing in the CCNA wireless now. Of course, Global Net Training teaches all Cisco authorized training from the CCNA, the CCNP, CCSP, CCBP, and the voice. The CCNA security and CCNA voice are very popular as well if you're planning on going down those tracks. Cisco has various tracks, and I encourage you to check out these various tracks that I've written about on my blog at www.lamley.com forward slash blog. Things every wireless LAN professional needs to know. Gear up, buckle down, and stand by for the real techie stuff. Hello again, this is Keith Parsons with Wireless Land Weekly. Today our guest is Dave Hutchison. Dave's had over 25 years out in the field. Uh, he's currently in Florida, but he's been all over the world, Africa, Asia, Afghanistan, etc. And we've brought him on today to talk a little bit about uh, reliability of electronic equipment. And from his years of experience, I'm sure he has lots of stories and can tell some good information about electronic equipment and how we can better take care of it. Dave? Thank you, Keith. Um, on a personal note, I'd like to say that I feel very grateful to be able to talk here today. As four years ago, I was told I would never walk again. And thanks to some amazing technology developed here in the US, I'm now back to health and able to lead a normal life again. I'd like to talk, first of all, about a couple of areas that may be of interest to folks listening out there in Wi-Fi land. Firstly, I'd like to talk about thermal effects in electronic equipment, including Wi-Fi and general routers and switches, etc. And then chat about some factors that affect the lifetime of electronic equipment. So firstly, let's have a chat about thermal effects. Um, if we were to open a wireless LAN controller or a Cisco switch or a Juniper router or any other pieces of electronic equipment, we'd probably find a bunch of wires and connectors and some fans. Most of the time, we probably wouldn't even give a second thought to these components inside these boxes. However, there's some physical issues involved that could cause downtime for the operators of these devices. I'd like to talk about what some of these are and what we can do to minimize their detrimental effects. <clears throat> Firstly, let's have a chat about manufacturer's data sheets. I have in front of me a data sheet from a well-known manufacturer of Wi-Fi access points. Under the environmental section, the data sheet tells us that the access point can operate over a range from 32 degrees Fahrenheit to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, does that mean that if we were to operate the device continuously at 104 degrees Fahrenheit, that we should expect to have the same lifetime for the equipment as when we operate the device at room temperature? And the answer is a very big no. For every 10 degrees Celsius above normal operating temperature, the lifetime of the electronic equipment drops by 50%. That's in a sustained mode. This is an exponential decay <clears throat> and is very important to system operators. Why should this be? There are many factors involved here, but one of them is due to the fact that when temperatures increase, current flow through semiconductor devices is affected in a negative way. Printed circuit boards contain components with metal leads which either go through the printed circuit board to the other side or partly through the printed circuit board in the case of a multi-layer unit or are attached to metal traces on the top of the unit. These metal leads are often made up of an amalgam of different metals. Solder or solder as it is called in the UK is usually used to connect these leads to the metallic traces of the circuit boards. Different metals have different degrees of thermal expansion. This means that one metal will expand more than another for a given temperature change. In electronic equipment, as the temperature changes up and down, these metals expanding and contracting at different rates can create strain within themselves and their neighbours. 
Imagine that you took a household kitchen knife, which is quite a strong item, and using gloves, you gently bent it back and forth every day for a year. I think you can see that after a period of time, it would eventually break. Even though each day only a tiny amount of force was being used, the repeated application of that force eventually would lead to failure of the metal. Now, does this mean that when cracks appear in metal leads, traces and components, that you'll be able to see them with the naked eye? In most cases, the answer is no. A device called a scanning electron microscope can be used to see these cracks. So why are the cracks important? When electronic circuitry is designed, engineers calculate how much current will flow in a particular conductor. The resistance of that conductor is very important. If there are small cracks present in the metal, this can lead to high resistance areas and literally hot spots in the metal. If the cracks are large enough, they can completely prevent currents flowing at all. So if you have equipment working in an environment where there are large and daily swings in temperature, these effects can be highly detrimental. If all the equipment cannot be kept in temperature controlled areas, it's always a good idea to try and at least keep the more expensive items like wireless LAN controllers in a temperature controlled area. There are four other main lifetime killers of electronic equipment. The first one is dust. I think all of us at one time or another have looked at our desktop PCs or printers and thought to ourselves, hmm, that looks as if they could do with a good cleaning. This is actually more important than it first appears to be. Integrated circuits are designed so that the heat which is generated within them can be dissipated into the surrounding air. This is very important as the lifetime of the electronic equipment is highly dependent on the ambient temperature. When dust gets into electronic equipment, it can form a blanket over these chips and devices. Due to this insulating blanket, heat cannot properly escape from the chips and be dissipated. This leads to burn a buildup of heat inside the chips. Some of these chips can become so hot they can literally burn your fingers. The next problem is humidity. Integrated circuits have come a long way over the last 25 years. The very first ones contain fairly large sized pins, which you could easily see and usually fitted into a socket. Modern integrated circuits, such as the small outline integrated circuits or or SOEX, contain so many pins that you can barely discriminate them with a the naked eye. If there is high ambient humidity, the water can form a thin, invisible film over the electronic components. Even though pure water is not a very good conductor of electricity, it still conducts some electricity. This can lead to microcurrents forming between pins on an electronic circuit. These microcurrents are not good and can lead to failure or degradation of the device's performance. Now we have to go back to dust. A rather bizarre fact is that in a household, over 80% of dust is actually human skin. In an industrial environment or even an office environment, the dust will contain many components which can partially conduct electricity. Now when we have a dust-filled electronic chassis, along with high humidity, a partly conducting film is formed. This is not good, and affects the lifetime of the equipment. Have you ever been in an electronic equipment room and listened to nothing but the gentle hum of fans? Most of us have, but I'm sure that most of us have also heard the brrrr of a fan that is heading towards the end of its lifetime. Why does the fan make this noise? Fans contain small electric motors, and the small electric motors contain a metal shaft. The metal shaft lies within a housing. Between the housing and the shaft, they're usually tiny ball bearings surrounding by lubricating fluids such as oil. Over time and due to gravity, etc., these tiny ball bearings can change shape from a spherical shape to a less spherical shape with bumps in them. It's these tiny bumps that cause the noise in most cases with fans. So why should this concern us? The problem is that as the fan vibrates, this vibration is transferred to all the electronic components within the chassis. The metals used in modern solders or solders are not titanium hard. These metals can eventually crack in the same manner as was caused by thermal expansion and contraction. Have you ever seen a router or wireless LAN controller or PC that just keeps rebooting? Many times this is due to some of the physical problems that I've mentioned. Often the temperature of the device will increase to such a point that thermal sensors inside the device will cause it to shut down. The device then reboots after a short cooling off period 
operates for a short time and then shuts down again. So what can be done about this? There are two groups of people who can help with this. Firstly, manufacturers, and secondly, equipment operators. In days gone by, manufacturers were very strict about quality control and the production of the electronic circuit boards and components. After a printed circuit board had been constructed, it would be put along with others on a special table that would vibrate the boards for at least 24 hours. In this manner, if there were any problems with the soldering on these boards, it would tend to show up. For instance, if a blob of solder was not solid all the way through, but instead had a tiny air bubble inside that could cause problems later on down the road. The vibration tests would tend to catch these faults before leaving the factory. After this was done, the boards would be placed in an environmental chamber, basically a device that acts as a heater and refrigerator. The boards would then be subjected to the environmental test range which the manufacturer specified. Again, potential faults would normally show up at this point. As you can imagine, this is a fairly expensive business due to the fact that instead of just taking these boards straight off the assembly line, they now have to spend a day or two days or even more in some cases being tested like this. This was known as the burn-in period. Military systems are subjected to much higher quality control standards in general than civilian systems. Sadly, nowadays, due to increased competition and shareholder pressure, very often these tests are minimised or in many cases not performed at all. Sometimes the manufacturer will perform these tests, but perhaps with only a small sample, say one in a hundred or one in a thousand. The second group who can help with this are the actual equipment operators themselves. Wherever possible, it's a good idea to have electronic equipment in a well air-conditioned, properly humidified and low dust environment. Obviously, this cannot be done in all circumstances. For instance, in many circumstances, access points will just have to be placed in areas where there is no or restricted air conditioning. This is just something we have to live with. However, when we have a wireless LAN controller costing 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 or how many other dollars, we should try wherever possible to keep that device in a place that's environmentally conditioned. If a fan is heard to be vibrating, then it should not be ignored and should be replaced as soon as possible. Depending upon if the equipment is under warranty or not, this can be done by an equipment swap out or a simple cover removal and fan replacement. If the equipment has exceeded its warranty, the covers can be removed and using proper electrostatic discharge prevention techniques, the inside can be blown free of dust. One last area is that of power and grounding. This would actually involve another audio cast as there's not enough time to go into all of this in detail. However, I will say that having a proper ground connected to the equipment chassis, usually via the electrical power system, is very important not only for safety and proper equipment operation, but also to help prevent static electric discharge from damaging the equipment, especially in dry, low humidity areas, for example, up north during the winter. Over the last 25 years or so, I've worked on approximately 2,000 or so faults of all different types according to my logbooks. These faults have ranged from faulty telex machines to problems in multi-million dollar satellite systems. For all of them, I made a note of the environmental conditions the equipment was operating in. Time after time, I would see the same equipment working in different environmental conditions. In one location, equipment would be in a well air conditioned low dust environment. In another location, equipment would have no or poor air conditioning and have dust all over the place. The difference in failure rates of these items was dramatic. In some places with good environmental conditioning, equipment would last for 15 years without any form of failures. In others, sometimes equipment would fail after a few months. Over the last few years, we've seen the introduction of 802.11n equipment with its substantially greater power requirements than previous generations. The physical size of the equipment has not changed very much, so it will be interesting to see the effects of greater thermal output on equipment lifetimes. Laptops are becoming crammed to the gunnels with more and more equipment, including Wi-Fi gear. If you ever feel the bottom of some laptops, you may be surprised as to just how hot parts of the material can become. I hope that this has shed a little light onto some of the reasons why electronic equipment fails. There are many other reasons, but vibration, temperature, humidity and static electric discharge are some of the main culprits. 
Simple precautions such as making sure that ventilation holes are left clear can make a big difference in equipment lifetime and reliability. Thank you. Dave, thanks. That was great. We learned a lot from your uh, experience, especially you have uh, those logbooks to actually track down and see what it is. It's actually a good idea for the rest of us to start tracking logs on our equipment so we can follow them up. Well, I appreciate your time today, and hopefully we'll have you back. Thank you. Thank you too, Dave. Well, sorry to say, it's the end of another show. Episode 5 is now in the books. We're glad to be able to have Ryan Woodings talk to us about visualizing RF uh, at the physical layer. And Dave Hutchison just finished up with the, the reliability of electronics. Thanks for tuning in. And again, if you have any questions or you have any feedback at all, we'll be glad to have you send us your feedback, either voicemail at the voicemail line or email. We'll take it either way. If you have questions about Wi-Fi, we're also starting up a new Wireless LAN Answers podcast. And Wireless LAN Answers podcast is going to come out in a couple weeks. It'll be a live show, meaning we'll be recording it live. Me, Keith Parsons, along with a couple of other co-hosts, send in your questions about Wi-Fi and we'll answer them live on the show and send out a new podcast just for that. That's called Wireless LAN Answers. that will be coming to you the 1st of March. Glad you could join us today. We look forward to seeing you next week on the next episode of Wireless LAN Weekly. Thank you. Wireless LAN Weekly, a podcast focused on the needs of wireless LAN professionals. We look forward to your feedback. Please leave your comments at the bottom of the show notes or email feedback on the show can be sent to feedback at wirelesslandprofessionals.com. If you'd like to leave a voicemail feedback, just call 24-7 and leave a message at 1-801-481-9018. Until next time, this has been another production of wirelesslandprofessionals.com, a place to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire.